Hello students, welcome to your final week of video lectures for this course. We're going to be talking about different kinds, the two kinds of single payer systems this week. First, the beverage model for nationalized healthcare. So the beverage model is from economist William Beveridge. It was first passed in the UK in 1946. In this model, healthcare is provided by the government, paid for by tax revenues, the same way that we have public school, libraries, sidewalks, um, and the healthcare itself is allocated based on your ability, like your, your need for healthcare rather than your ability to pay. So there is no price-based rationing of resources and it really promotes equity. There are three defining features of the beverage model. Number one is universal single payer insurance. All citizens get this government insurance and it's fully paid by taxes, not by premiums. Healthcare itself is publicly provided, so the hospitals and clinics are run by the government, and it is free at the point of care, so when you show up, you don't pay anything out of your pocket. Some countries have exceptions for things like prescription drugs, um, eyeglasses, and dentistry. There's a lot of countries that have this beverage model, especially the UK Commonwealth countries, so former colonies like Canada and Australia, and the Scandinavian countries like Sweden and Norway. There are some variations in the way that each country implements this beverage model. In Canada, for example, it's more of a hybrid. The hospitals are technically privately run, but heavily regulated. Um, Sweden has some cost sharing. Australia has a private hospital sector. Um, but as a rule for the beverage model, they have to ration their care, but not on the basis of price. Every healthcare system faces these two fundamental questions of how much care is going to be produced and who is going to get it. Private markets use prices to answer those questions. The scarce resources are allocated to those who are most willing and able to pay, so price-based rationing. But this disadvantages the poor. So in the beverage system, instead of price rationing, they, um, they make all of the healthcare free, but use other strategies of rationing, which ends up including things like queuing wait times, gatekeeping, and health technology assessment. Queues arise in the beverage system because Healthcare is free, so there's a lot of demand. In the private market, they could just find ways of recruiting more providers, like raising salaries. Um, but in the beverage systems, the salaries are set by the government, so the market's not going to equilibrate. So with high demand and a set or restricted level of supply, you're going to end up with wait times. In 1990, median wait times for English inpatients was five months. So, and more than 20% had to wait a year. This means that some people who really needed care might not have been able to receive it. And it was a bit like a politically inflammatory, politically sensitive issue. So they've implemented a lot of reforms since then to reduce wait times. Um, cues, on the other hand, there are some benefits. It can limit moral hazard. For example, deterring people who don't actually need the costly procedure. Some hospitals, like in, in the UK in the 80s, you know, only half of the people still wanted it by the time they um, their like number came up in the system. And unlike price-based rationing of resources, it treats the rich and poor equally. So this promotes the equity-centric goal of the beverage system. If you, uh, just for a model of how to think about cues, imagine that there are two types of patients. U patients for whom the surgery would be very useful, and W patients for whom it would be a little bit wasteful, just only marginally useful. And some subset of those for whom it would be useful are also poor, so U sub P. So the surgeon just sees a list, of, like a, you know, a list of people who are all interested. Some are U's, some are W's, some are UP's. If it's just first come, first serve, then some of those people in line are going to be the W wasteful people in line before the U's. Because it's free for everybody. So everyone's just, anyone who like kind of wants it is going to sign up. Um, it, when you have price-based rationing, it is going to get those W's, the wasteful people, out 
of line, but it's also going to get the UPs, those for whom it's useful, but people who are poor. It does reduce wait times when you have price-based rationing, um, but it also removes some people who need it. So in that sense, it's inefficient. Another way of using, of like cutting down those wait times is gatekeeping. It's a way of separating the W's from the U's without distinction, distinguishing between U and UP. So in most of these beverage type systems, all patients have to visit a general practitioner, like a primary care physician, before they can go and see a specialist. So the GPs, these general practitioners, act as gatekeepers. And only the patients that they deem as needing the care can visit a specialist. So it's kind of like triaging. So there are these two ways of reducing cues. One of them is decreasing demand, which is things like gatekeepers, strict eligibility for um, accessing care, prioritizing patients, triaging them essentially. The other one is through increasing supply. You can hire more doctors, build more hospitals, you know, pay medical staff better to recruit more people. Um, you can outsource care to private providers if there is limited uh, supply in the public market. And each one of these strategies is going to have some trade-off between equity, health, and wealth. Uh, governments typically, though, adopt a combination of these tactics and apply them to different degrees and in different situations. So, um, Different countries are going to have different levels of success with reducing wait times as a result. The UK has substantially reduced wait times, but in Canada, on the other hand, they're seeing increases in wait times. Health technology assessment is another tool that they use in beverage countries to um, meet the demand for care. So because the government pays for all of the healthcare, health technology assessment like they have a big need for that, for using HTA in determining what to cover. And also it ends up having like a very big impact in what kinds of services people are going to end up having access to. Some patients would even have to go abroad to access a service that's been denied by their country's health technology assessment. Um, the decisions can be really controversial because they determine who gets treatment and, and who does not. Um, HTA has become increasingly centralized over the years. Before it was like a regional local decision, but that ends up with like disparate menus of what is being covered, even within the same country. So only in the 80s and 90s did they move towards a national scale for health technology assessment. So in the UK, the NICE, which is the National Institute for Clinical um, Effectiveness, was established in 1999 and in 2005 became binding for England and Wales. Uh, there are similar systems in place in different beverage nations, and in some cases, the um, centralized HTA recommendations are not binding, but just a suggestion.